Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another edition of Professional Perspectives with St. Joseph's College Language Center, headed by Vicky. And we are all here together to listen to the journey of Anoop Singh. To mention a little something about Anoop, he is into films, he writes poems, and boy, when I say uh, he writes poems, they are deep. So you really have to sit and read them to understand them and to really cherish the words, the way he uses words. Films, what did Anoop do? He's a writer, he's a director, and he is the one who set up the Wandering Film Company in Mumbai. And this is in association with writers and producers in both UK and Switzerland. Anup has been in Geneva, Switzerland for a while now. And uh, let's make it say 20 years, if I'm not mistaken. Am I right, Anup? You are. <laughs> Great. And has been a writer, filmmaker, as well as a teacher in film studies. The one thing I definitely know is that the Film and Television Institute of India in Pune is a place that Anup never misses to visit whenever he's in India. And he is revered there by anyone and everyone who knows about him. So uh, I think I should say less and let's get started with listening to Anup live. Over to you, Vicky. Okay. Welcome. All right. Great introduction. And I was thinking, I think we'll start broad and we'll get narrower. So we won't ask you two personal questions yet. Okay. We'll start with um, the field of film, which of course is why so many of us are here tonight to hear about it. We, uh, we would like to hear from you, Anoop, how you just grabbed a hold of this field and became passionate about it? Was it something you grew up with? I mean, everybody loves movies. So tell us how you captured the, the passion of filmmaking. Uh, Wiki, I think this is really a very important question because if we are speaking to someone uh, younger, let's say, and someone who might be interested in a certain field, then I think it's very, very important and I feel a great sense of responsibility uh, when I talk about myself with students uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, passion, passion comes from all sorts of sources, but uh, you have to allow that passion to speak to you. Let me give you an example uh, in my case. Uh, I had, I had uh, been born and I was brought up in, uh, in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, East Africa. Uh, you know, I had my friends there, my family was there. I, I had a very happy childhood. And suddenly one day, uh, due to political reasons, um, I had to leave with my parents, uh, the country, which was the country of my birth. And uh, the only country really that I knew. And uh, it, it happened very abruptly. We uh, took a ship from uh, Dar es Salaam to Mumbai. My father had been born also in Tanzania. In fact, his grandfather had also not been born, but he had been there from the age of three. My father had never left the country. He was 40 years old and he knew only Africa, uh, Tanzania. When we got onto the ship, uh, I can only ask you to imagine the kind of uh, depression that we were all in. We did not know if we would ever be able to come back to uh, our home. Uh, so we stayed in the cabin of the ship for uh, about three nights. We didn't even, we didn't go out at all. On the third night, I heard some banging up on the deck and I was intrigued, I was curious. And finally on, on the third evening, uh, I went up 
And I noticed that they were constructing something on the deck of the ship. And what they were constructing finally was a film screen. And they said that there will be a film screening uh, here on the deck of the ship later tonight. I went downstairs, I coaxed my parents to come upstairs and we all settled ourselves for the night uh, to watch the screening. And while we were waiting, we were talking about the loss of our home, our country. And then the film began. And there was something very strange there because here was a film screen with this vast African sky above it and uh, this boundless ocean below us and this film screen of talking about our world, you know, in the middle of the universe. And I think that was the moment when I realized that uh, I'm not homeless. This journey is not making me homeless. That as long as I could live in this world of nature, in our universe, with cinema before me, I would always have a home. This was my home. Wow. And I think that is the kind of, uh, it's not a passion. It is not an obsession. I think it is a kind of deep understanding of what it is that gives you a sense of yourself, that gives you a sense of home, that tells you that this is your family, and in even larger terms tells, tells you that in this vast world of ours, this is your small world. So passions come and go, obsessions come and go, but you leave your world only when you die. And as long as you are alive, you live in that world because it is the world that sustains you. It gives you relationships. Uh, it gives you a sense of yourself. It, it, uh, it helps you to grow. It gives you a language or it gives you many languages, hopefully. You know. So this is where you realize that this is your life. Your choice is your life. Life is not simply that you breathe. Uh, life is when you breathe, you breathe in the world and all that it gives you. And more importantly, when you breathe out, you are ready to give back yourself to the world. If you can do that easily, in calm, without any prejudices, you know you are at home. So that was uh, the beginning for me, uh, Wiki. That, um, that idea of finding your small story within the big picture is, is finding home. I never thought of it that way. So well said, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Anita? Yes. So what next then? Then what happened? Your time? Well, well Anita, then it's, then it's a journey. Once you understand that this is what is going to be your world, once you understand that uh, this is what is giving you your breath, right? not a breath, again, not the breath that simply allows you to live, but a breath that fills your blood with uh, pulsations, you know, that uh, makes you incandescent, inflames you. Right? It gives you an energy that you didn't know you had. It gives you an insight into things. Uh, it, it makes your senses alive. Yeah. Um, once you, I think, realize that, then you have to follow a path. And the path is uh, often something that you will, but often it is also uh, shackled to chance. All right. uh, was, it setting, was it setting goals or following a dream? Uh, you, it is following a dream. And then you try to give the dream a direction. But life is a dream too, and of course it goes its own way. 
Will, will so you tell I, us what, what was your big break in this idea of filmmaking? I, I think I, uh, it started with me starting to paint. Oh. Uh, I started drawing and painting. That was, uh, you know, my way of trying to understand the new world into which I had been thrown, uh, which world I had to make my own. I, did, I didn't know the language, you know. I, I didn't know the people, they were strangers to me. Uh, the, the studies at school were very different in Mumbai compared to what they were in uh, Dar es Salaam. Uh, the idea of play was different, the idea of music was different. The, the uniform, of course, was different, you know. So anything that touches the body, touches the eyes, what you smell, you know, what you taste, everything was different for me. So I needed to find my understanding of it. And I think drawing helped me a lot and painting. So that was my sort of entry into trying to make the strange space my space. Ah. From drawing, I went to writing. Uh, I wrote my first novel when I was, I think, 16 or something. You know, it, it was a highly, uh, uh, what's the word? I was highly influenced by the writers I was reading at that time. So, you know, um, it was a mix of Enid Blyton and, uh, 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 you know, uh, some thriller um, and some newspaper stories. All right, it, it was just a melange, a mix of nothing, except that it gave me a sense of putting small, small things uh, in this chaos. There were small, small things that I felt were speaking to me, that were telling me my story. For instance, you know, when I take the train, I am perhaps the only one on the train who need not stretch his arms to balance myself because I was the tallest on the train, you know. So it gave me a sense of myself. It showed me a certain relationship with people, even though it was, you know, just in terms of shapes. I was a tall shape and there were, you know, not so tall shapes. I was very proud of that. So, uh, you know, language helps you in these kind of tiny ways. It's not only a matter of uh, expressing yourself or communicating. Language in itself gives you tiny little, uh, uh, insights into yourself. Sometimes you put two words together and these words actually tell you who you are at that moment. All right. And you might not like what language says to you sometimes, but it always offers you some insight. You know, that so was one of my questions about language. So I'm glad you're talking about it. Please go on. Certainly. Uh, from language, I started writing plays. I did a lot of theater. And then very soon I had my own theater group in Mumbai. And we were performing plays that I would write, but we would also perform plays uh, uh, by other writers. You know, uh, um, we would do, I was very interested in, in some of the absurdist uh, playwrights. So Samuel Beckett, for example. Mm -hmm. you know, um, on the other hand, I was very interested in uh, Tennessee Williams, for example, you know. Uh, so a range, we were doing really a range of things. Um, and from theater, then it seemed like a kind of natural development towards uh, cinema. Were you uh, an actor or were you, you, did you put this theater group together or were you uh, into acting? No, no, um, I had very little interest in acting. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I was a writer-director. I knew from the very beginning that I had no interest in acting. And uh, I wanted to write and I wanted to make the plays or finally the films. Right. So from there, uh, it was a matter of chance. I was 16. Uh, at that point. When you started the theater group too, you were 16? I was 16. And uh, a friend of mine, by chance, 
told me that, look, there, is, there were three national newspapers in India at that time. And one of them was called the Free Press of India. So a friend of mine came to me and said, look, there's this Free Press of India. They are looking for a film reviewer. You know, why don't you apply? I said, I go to school, you know, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm just 16. <laughs> Is it, you, what's the harm in applying? Just apply, you know. So I'd written a few things and I sent them and I sent my application form. I was in, uh, invited to an interview and uh, I got the job. Yeah. So uh, I think, you know, once you understand what your world is and how you're working towards it, sometimes chance favors you. And uh, this was uh, the moment that I could then, as a journalist, enter the film industry. And the rest was, you know, a journey into uh, writing and rewriting and writing and rewriting, meeting people, them understanding what you wanted to do, uh, me understanding that I needed to learn more. So I went to the film school, which is FTII, the Film and Television Institute of India, which at that time was considered one of the five best film schools in the world. Uh, we had uh, film directors from all over the world come, uh, come uh, to teach us, uh, directors and writers from the US, from the UK, from Czechoslovakia, from Russia, uh, from Africa. Um, so it was a great uh, moment for me because um, I was learning, I was learning a lot. And uh, whatever I had done before helped me to uh, remain open uh, and never say to myself that I, I know uh, the all that I've now understood or now that I've mastered this or mastered that. And you realize, you know, and I think language teaches you that because you are never a master of the language. Language teaches you that you will always learn something new. And I think that is one of the most important things about not only living in your profession, but living in your life. That you live without prejudices, that you live without uh, uh, giving yourself false boundaries, and uh, you live without uh, mastery. Mm. Yeah. What would, was going to that school, was that like a turning point for you? Or what were some of your other turning points in your career and in your life? Uh, well, going to the school, certainly, of course. That was the turning point. Uh, I met some extraordinary film directors uh, at the Institute. Uh, they were my teachers. Um, and uh, as I was graduating, and at, at the end of uh, three years, you uh, have to make a, what is called a diploma film. Okay. So I just completed my diploma film and mm -hmm. it had won the main award in Germany and it was traveling the world. And it was all really, you know, with the kind of uh, uh, teaching behind me of my teachers. Um, and then they invited me to work with them. So I could be a, a, like a kind of apprentice on their films. Uh, working with them then led me slowly to make my own team and then to start making my own films. Ah, oh, yeah, I see it sort of coming together. Go ahead, Anita. Yeah, yeah so in fact, that's what I was going to ask next. Who have been the influential people in your life uh, who actually propagated, helped or supported or even pulled you back? It's a long list. Uh, you know, there are people that you meet uh, directly and you work with them. So there was a filmmaker. India is, is very well known um, <clears throat> for the cinema of uh, Satyajit Ray one of the world's greatest filmmakers. Uh, 
<coughs> he's, known, he's known all over the world. Um, uh, however, uh, there was his contemporary, uh, a man called Ritwik Ghatak. Uh, and Ritwik Ghatak used to be the head of the direction department at my film school. And uh, when I joined the film school, he was already dead uh, seven years. Yeah. However, he had taught uh, a number of uh, students and there were especially two who were working in his tradition. So when I watched the films of Ritik Khatak, uh, I think it changed the blood in my body. Uh, it's as though I'd been transfused by someone else's blood or some strange other spirit had taken me away. Um, and then his students uh, helped me a lot to find my blood again, you know, <laughs> so that I wouldn't just be a kind of copycat of uh, the master, you know, but uh, slowly, steadily, I would find my own language uh, in cinema. And to them, I owe a great deal because they were the direct students of Ritik Katak. However, their work showed nothing of his influence. And I understood that that is what a real master does, that he or she does not encourage you to uh, repeat or copy what he or she has done, but in fact, opens within you what is the best in you. So that was a great gift from my teachers. Uh, and for that, I'm eternally grateful. Opens within you what is already inside of you? Is that what you said? To a certain point, something that is inside of you, yes. Mm -hmm. But as you grow, you know, there are more and more things that uh, begin to find residence within you. I don't think there are things always inside you. I think you have to also take from the world, uh, but things that will complement and help your growth. You make mistakes and of course you take a lot of poison also, but in some ways even poison helps you to grow. Yeah, I'm sure that there are no like typical days for you, but can you give us an idea of of, of daily, what, what you do and um, how you do it and um, some of the different, besides writing and then obviously directing, but, but like a, a typical day in some ways or a typical week, because I'm sure every day is something <laughs> different. Um, uh, uh, there are two kinds of seasons, I think, uh, speaking in terms of days. There is a season when you're working and you are inspired and there are seasons when you're not working. So you have to you know, live these two seasons. Um, when you're working, there is no idea of time uh, because you feel that even if you're sleeping for two hours, uh, you're wasting time, that you're losing out on something. So, when I'm working, typically, I think I sleep at around 3 a.m. And I'm usually awake around 6 or 7 a.m. By 8 a.m., I'm at my table <clears throat> in front of my computer. And as a filmmaker, you know, there are always two aspects. One is the business aspect, because uh, there's a lot of money involved in, in, in the making of a film. And therefore, you need to find producers who would be interested in uh, making your next film. Um. And now there's, of course, you know, uh, I've been lucky enough to work with producers from various parts of the world. So, uh, which means there are different time zones. Um, wow. So at six in the morning, then, you know, it's, let's say, uh, about 12 o'clock in uh, Mumbai. Uh, it is some other time in, in the yeah. US. It is some other time. It's an hour earlier, let's say, in, in the UK. 
So the first part of the morning really goes in speaking with the producers, uh, telling them what I'm doing next, uh, how will we collaborate together, what is their contribution, if there is one person who is interested, then how will we bring another producer so that, you know, we, since my films are challenging, they're provocative, uh, they're not mainstream. Um, I do need two or three producers. Uh, a single producer is not enough uh, uh, for my films. So bringing all, let's say, three or four producers together takes time. That as soon as uh, you know, I have some understanding of what is happening in terms of the funding of my films, I am working on uh, the writing of the film. Uh, usually I write all my film scripts. Uh, I don't have any writer writing for me because I really want to write my own uh, films. That takes time. Usually a film script, writing a film script, can take anything from six months to six years. You know. wow. Sometimes uh, it, uh, the story just speaks to you and it can even come together in, uh, in, in two weeks, it, it is ready. In fact, my last film, The Song of Scorpions came to me in a dream and I woke up uh, from it and I jotted notes immediately and in two weeks time, I had a film script ready. Wow. However, there are other films, for example, my very first film, uh, The Name of a River, uh, um, which was a Britain, Bangladesh, India co-production. Co um, that took me 10 years to make for various reasons. Also because, uh, 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 of finding money uh, over time. So I would shoot a little, then wait for the next, next uh, bit of money, then shoot a little more. So it took 10 years for me to make that film. Um, I like to cook. So because I'm uh, working intensely, uh, I do my own cooking. Um, my wife, she, uh, she works at the United Nations, uh, so she leaves very early in the morning. Uh, I do my own cooking and that helps me a lot to uh, calm down, to reflect, um, to take uh, a slightly different breath uh, before I come back in the afternoon, after lunch, uh, back to work. And then I write uh, until about uh, uh, 6 p.m. 6 p.m. I might go uh, for a jog, I might walk around um, and then I'll do cooking again uh, for my wife and I and we'll have dinner let's say by 8 p.m. 9 p.m. 10 p.m. my wife goes to bed and then from 10 to uh, 3 a.m. I'm usually either reading or uh, I'm watching a film that I really want to see um, so that more or less is what my days are like. So one question from me, uh, what uh, really brought you or challenged you or uh, was it an offer that you set up the curriculum for the Film Institute uh, in Geneva? Oh. Uh, uh, after eight years in uh, Mumbai, uh, my father, you know, who had been born and brought up in uh, Tanzania, uh, he found it very difficult to work in Mumbai. Um, that whole lifestyle did not suit him. So after eight years, we, uh, uh, we moved to the UK. And by that time, I'd almost finished my, my film studies. Um, so after I'd graduated and my film was doing well, uh, and it had been seen by quite a few people in the UK, I found that uh, I could uh, uh, find, uh, I was being invited to teach at various universities and at uh, some of the film schools. 
So that, that's what I was doing. I was, uh, I, I began to teach. Um, and while teaching, I was of course working on the side, you know. Uh, so what was your question, Anita? I um, don't know if I... Was, no, that's okay. Uh, was it an offer to uh, write the curriculum? Uh, uh, yeah, right, okay. So because I have been teaching now, let's say for, for about three to four years, I've been teaching at various universities and at the film schools here in the, I mean, there in the UK. Um, um, people had heard of me and of, of the kind of workshops that I was doing. And I was being then invited uh, to Europe, to various other places. And one of the uh, art schools that invited me because they had a cinema section uh, in the art school was here in Geneva. So they invited me, I came in, I did a workshop, which uh, the students liked a lot. And then the next year, <coughs> the school made me an offer. They said that uh, their cinema section has three classrooms and each classroom is given to a filmmaker to teach as he or she wants to. So we are ready to give you a classroom. It is your classroom. You will uh, do the syllabus uh, and you will run it the way you want to run it. And it's yours. Wow. It was too good an offer for me to refuse. <laughs> you know? uh, so that is how uh, I came to Geneva. Wow. So how long have you been in Geneva? I think it's going to be about 22 years now. Okay. Wow. And <laughs> do, you, do you do a lot of traveling? I do a lot of traveling. Uh, obviously not during the COVID period, but uh, now that uh, the dangers of the pandemonium, uh, the pandemic have uh, sort of died or are at least becoming less and less, um, I'm traveling, traveling a lot, yes. Why do you travel so much? There are two reasons. Um, one, again, again, to meet people uh, for business. Oh, okay. you know, while you can do a lot of business uh, nowadays on, uh, on, uh, online, people, when they want to give you money, they also want to see you face to face. Uh. You know? <laughs> they want to spend time with you. They want to understand really what sort of a person you are because when you're making a film, you're going to spend a, at least a minimum of two years together. All right. Okay. And uh, it's not only a matter of trust because you can save your money, et cetera, et cetera. You make sure that I don't run away with it. You know, all that is, is what business is. But more important is that you trust me uh, that uh, the vision that I will bring and with that vision, the film that we will make together will be a film that we can be proud of. All right. So that kind of trust is very important for me too. I need to trust the producer that in the middle of the film, he or she will not turn around and say, uh, this is not the film that I wanted to make. And you know, um, you're just doing what you want to do. No, do it like this. Don't do it like that. So, I find a clarity with my producers in the very beginning. And I've been lucky that uh, in terms of uh, all the films that I've done, they've finally actually just given me a very free hand and I've had practically no interference in the making of the film. Once the film is done, then my job is done, then it's up to them to market it. The producer's job to market it. That's right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. I have nothing to do with the marketing. Okay. All right. I give them the film and I say, now it's your baby. All right. Okay. So from journalism to film, learning film, painting, and then to making the movies and the movies uh, becoming award-winning ones, it's a long journey. And you've been to several places and you've made Tanzania home, you've made India home, you've made UK and Geneva home. Where is it that your heart belongs? Uh, to cinema. 
you know, as I said, uh, when I was describing to you what brought me to cinema, because when I see the film screen between the sky and the sea, you know, and let's say that the ship is the earth, uh, uh, I realize that uh, my home is, is the universe. Uh, and I feel really that that has helped that sense that my home is not a room, that my home is not a mansion, that my home is not a chalet, you know, but it is really this whole universe around me. And I think that sense of living in the world gives me a measure of myself. So I don't measure myself in terms of how high the walls of my house are. Really, it is the sky that gives me my measure. You know? oh, and that I think I... Is, is what allows me to be the kind of filmmaker that I am. Nature, nature is very, very important to me. Does your wife share the same view as you? Uh, to a large extent, yes. To a large extent. Uh, without her, you know, I would not be the filmmaker that I am today, really. There is uh, not only love and uh, uh, trust behind me at all moments, but more than that, there is, uh, it, it is very curious what I'm going to say, but it's very important. There's respect behind it, you know. So the kind of respect that we finally have found for each other's work gives us a great uh, energy to continue in our paths. And our paths are actually very different. How know, long she's an economist been... and uh, I'm a filmmaker. How long have you been married? Uh, we're just going to celebrate our 15th uh, anniversary. Oh, very nice. Mm. Very nice. Okay, so, our, our, another question, Anita, before we open it up to our... Yes, yes, please. Please go ahead. So in terms of a career, what is it that you would guide or how to really focus and progress when selecting a field? How would you guide the students? the ones who are in our room here today, as well as anybody else who might be interested in pursuing that particular career or any career for that matter? Words it depends, you know, uh, again, let's say that there are two aspects to it. One, because I have nephews and nieces, you know, who are now seeking to find their own careers. I see two, two aspects, I see one, where there is a belief that uh, if I can find a comfortable life as quickly as possible, then I will be free to do other things. Mm. The other is that uh, uh, I am not born into this world to be comfortable. I am born in this world to grow, you know, to find myself. So these are two aspects. And I think the sooner any person is clear about what aspect uh, uh, speaks to them, you know, then choices become a little more easier. My suggestion to my nephews, nieces, my students uh, uh, anywhere in the world uh, is that if you feel that you need a certain quality of life uh, uh, in terms of uh, comfort, uh, and then you believe that you can do whatever you want to do uh, uh, as a pass, as a hobby. All right, it is a uh, it is a very fine fine thing. There's a clarity there, and I respect that. And sometimes when you work on a hobby, you know that hobby because you are not trying to make money out of the hobby, you can be much more free. All right, and uh, you can then find a balance there. And I, I, I have great respect for that. And that is very fine. On the other hand, uh, uh, there is a spirit that says to you that uh, I don't know who I am. I don't know what this world is. I don't know the people of these, this world. I don't understand what a tree really is. What is this flower 
Where does this fragrance come from? What is the sky saying to me? Is there really a God there or not? If you are full of these kind of questions, uh, then there is no alternative, but you have to enter deep into yourself and the world and the universe um, through whatever language that you feel will allow you to speak to this world. So it could be the language of literature, it could be the language of fine arts, it could be the language of music, it could be the language of uh, cinema. Uh, that language uh, will tell you uh, how you will live. Uh, and in fact, that language will become your world. But the initial clarity as to which aspect of living you want to do is very, very important. And you need to be honest about it, all right? Yeah. Not shy, not embarrassed, you know, because this is your life. Unless you choose to live your life, it will be false. Yes, wow, well said. Beautifully said. Well said. Well said. Okay, I'm going to change the view here to gallery. So we have a lot of names on the screen, but sometimes those names, Anu, become pictures. All right, okay, <laughs> wonderful. And, and so um, uh, Anita and I might think of another question or, or use some, but we like to open it up to everyone here to ask a question. So you can raise your hand, you can unmute, uh, you can put something in the chat. Um, now's your chance. So sir, um, you had written a book titled Dial uh, Irfan Dialogues with the Wind. Yes. So uh, could you just share a brief journey of yours with Irfan sir? Uh, indeed, I mean, um, that is one of my great joys. Um, um, Irfan and I, we have worked together on uh, two films. Um, and uh, I will give you a sense of our first meeting because in that first meeting, you will see how already the seeds of a very intense uh, working relationship and a friendship came together. Um, when I first approached uh, Irfan to do uh, an earlier film, he, uh, oh, by the way, for the others who might not know, Irfan Khan is one of the most celebrated actors in India. And unfortunately he passed away uh, about a year ago. And uh, I've, I've written a book as a kind of memoir of our work and friendship together. So she's, uh, her question is about Irfan Khan, the actor. Um, so when I approached him to do my film, he read the script and he said, uh, you know, I am haunted by your story, what you have written, but I can't do it because it is too dark. You know, and if I'm to live with this story for a year, two years, I, I can't live with that kind of heaviness. You know, so you have to forgive me, but uh, I can't do this film. So of course I was very uh, dis disillusioned and uh, saddened because I really thought he's the only one who could do this uh, particular character in the film. As I was walking away from his house, uh, it suddenly struck me that uh, he had perhaps read the scenario, the script that I'd given him completely wrong, that he had misunderstood it. You know? So I rang him, I, I, I had gone down the building and I rang him and I said, Irfan, I need 15 minutes. Can I come, come up again? Just give me 15 minutes. So he said, yes, please come up. So I went up again. And uh, he had taken the script that, that I'd given him and he had put it on the table to return it to me. You know? 
So I said to him, Irfan, you know, I know, for example, that you like the music of uh, Nusrat Ali Fateh Khan, the great uh, Kawali singer from Pakistan, immensely. All right. Um, Nusrat Ali Fateh Khan, if I were to give a kind of Western uh, uh, example, is a figure like Pavarotti. All right. He is that immense a singer. Um, I said, I know that you like Nusrat Ali Fatih Khan's uh, music very much. I said, have you ever seen uh, videos of Nusrat uh, uh, Saab uh, singing? He said, of course, I have. I said, you know, when you see uh, Nusrat uh, singing, you see how his face contorts because he's trying to find uh, a pitch, a note, which is torn out of him. And his whole face is contorted in the um, travail of finding that phrase. And you see that uh, sometimes that phrase becomes really horrific, you know? And I said, however, the music that comes out of his throat is without any doubt, one of some of the most sublime music that you and I have, have ever heard. So his face might be contorted. It might even be, look, monstrous at some point. But what comes out of him is almost a divine uh, music. I said, this is the kind of film that I would like to make. You might think it is heavy, you know, but what will come out of it will be something very different. And Irfan seemed to understand that immediately. He picked up the script that he was going to give to me and he put it under his arm and he said, let's do this film. I'm going to do it with you. So that gives you a sense, I think, uh, a little bit of how we could then from that point onwards become really excellent in terms of how we work together. And uh, it only deepened our friendship uh, over the two films that we uh, worked on. And I would certainly recommend both the films to be seen, uh, even though they are not mainstream, but they are movies that you really need to sit, watch, and absorb. And how do you find such movies since I'm... Uh, uh, how do I find them? Uh, you mean uh, how do I come to write them? Or how? No, how how do we find them? Um, uh, how do you to, find them? Right. To stream them, uh, to watch well, them. Well, they are available. Um, uh, my the, my first film with uh, Irfan is called uh, Kissa, Kissa, which means uh, a tale. Uh, the, uh, uh, the tale of uh, a tale of a lonely ghost is uh, the film. Um, it's available on Amazon, so. It's very easy to find. My second film uh, is going to take a little time because of the COVID, we had to delay its release. But uh, uh, I think very soon uh, it will find a release. And then I believe it will be on one of the international channels. So it will be very easy to see. Okay. All right, any other questions? We have nine minutes left. I think Anita and Salishma are going to be able to help me find your films. To watch. Yes. yes. And by the way, the movies have been award-winning movies. What kind of awards, Anup? Well, the, the film that I just mentioned, it won the Best Asian Film Award at the Toronto International Film Festival. And then from there, it just, uh, I think it's won something like 25 uh, major awards, including Best Actor, Best Actress, uh, Best Cinematography, Best Director, Best, uh, you know, so. Abu Dhabi and Dubai both remember you so much. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, as do I, as do I. All right, more questions. We have somebody very famous on our screen right now. <laughs> Yeah, please, uh, you know, uh, feel, feel free to ask anything that you like. Uh, I know that um, what, this is a certain age where things are very fragile. 
but uh, um, that's what filmmaking is. And in, in fact, uh, you know, we work with fragilities and we work with trying to reach out to people. So please feel free to ask anything that you like. Do you like the writing part more or the directing part more? I like both. Okay. The writing part, because then I'm uh, really in communion with myself. The directing part, because then I'm with 300 people, you know, and it's wonderful then to, you know, uh, be in a very intense uh, uh, and very lively uh, communication with people all around you. Are you guys being shy? Hold on, Tushika? Uh, yes, sir. So uh, I had a question. Um, I'm not sure if it's a silly question or not, but uh, because you worked as a director for films that were, uh, let's say, five, six, seven years back, how was the scenario different back then in the cinema industry from how it is now? And is there like, is there a difference or is it the same? Absolutely, there's a huge difference. Uh, when I made the, my very first film with Irfan, uh, you know, that film could be screened in the cinemas all over the world. Uh, and that is how I had, uh, that was my vision of the film because I wanted it to have the sense of largesse um, I wanted it to open really the universe uh, to uh, the viewers. And I wanted them to feel the sense of something really huge uh, in front of them. I wanted nature to overwhelm them, but at the same time, you know, to embrace them. And there is nothing better than cinema to do that you know, on the big screen. All right. Now, post COVID, um, Almost everything is uh, online. And cinema is in fact, uh, all over the world, uh, more than 50% or even more have closed down. Slowly, steadily, some cinemas are opening and we do not in the film industry as yet know uh, whether we are now doomed uh, in the sense that our films will only be seen on TV screens and laptops and mobile phones, or will we come back to the big screen? Um, and I must say to you that this is like, you know, um, for a filmmaker, this is really almost as though someone is breaking our backbone mm. because cinema is always meant to be seen on the big screen. And if that is not so, then in many ways, it is not cinema. Yeah, that's, yes, saddening to think about. There's a, a question I want to read from the chat. What is the influence of your traveling on the creation of film characters? Share any incident or character influenced by your traveling or your meeting people. Certainly. Um, let me give you an example uh, from a very recent uh, bit of travel that I did. I was in Senegal about uh, a fortnight ago. And uh, when I was there, I was, uh, uh, I, I met a musician, a, a woman uh, who is um, in her 80s now. She comes from uh, a tradition of folk singers in Africa. However, she's a star. She's one of the most uh, well-known singers in Africa. And she's been singing for maybe 60 years, maybe actually, maybe even more, uh, this woman who's in her 80s now. And uh, when I met, went to meet her, because I wanted to listen to her face to face, uh, when I went to meet her, um, she was on a chair uh, like a queen. Right? And uh, she was covered uh, with all kinds of drapes and shawls and so if she was slim, which I don't know because I couldn't see her body under all those blankets and shawls, she was now, she had now expanded. You know, she was overflowing this really large chair on which she sat. Okay. 
And then when she spoke to me, her gestures were always gestures of courtesy. You know, tell me what, what would you like? I mean, she was the queen, you know. She, should, she could grant me wishes. Uh, <laughs> that's what it was. So once we started to speak, I spoke to her about one of her songs. And I said, you know, uh, in that particular song that you do, there's a moment uh, when you are saying this word uh, and your breath there, you know, something happens to it and the whole inflection of the next phrase is something that made me cry. You know? So she looked at me for a long moment and then she started to sing uh, without any instrumentation or anything. And uh, at that same point, at that same word, again, there was that breath and that whole inflection uh, changed. And even though I was there very, very, you know, social, polite, in a very uh, uh, formal setting, my eyes went humid again. You know, I, I just couldn't help it. And uh, I said, what is that? She said, uh, I'm singing about my child who died. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And uh, the song is not about my child at all. All right. But the song, this word here is, is one of the words that my child used to like very much. Yeah. Oh. So when I say the word, I hear him. And it affected me when I was singing it. Wow. Yeah. So when I now think of this woman and I think of, you know, how she presented herself as, you know, someone untouchable, way grand and beyond humanity, you know, someone divine. And then suddenly out of all this, these colors and these textures that were hiding her, emerges this woman who is a mother and uh, who is just a simple person who is very happy that you have seen something of her pain. Yeah. These are two totally different people in the same person. So these are the kind of things that, you know, one waits for and sometimes one is lucky to uh, be given such a presence as a present. <laughs> oh, that's a great story. Is it? Mm. And, uh, uh, wonderful story to end on unless if there's something very pressing otherwise I, I you know we promised one hour so we want to keep our word and uh, the lady who asked that uh, Padma Shri said oh wow thank you for sharing that so that was that thank was you. a great a great story mm -hmm. yes cool. all right well we would like if uh, we want to just leave you with a very a small uh, gift of a picture of uh, all of us. Oh, to, wonderful. And so if you all would please be so kind as to turn on your videos for a moment, I will snap a screenshot and we will share it with Anu. I wanna thank while, we, while you're all turning your videos on, I wanna thank you all for coming. Thank you for taking the time out and especially Anu. Thank you. Uh, uh, my heart and my mind are, are full and I learned so much tonight. You know, you just, it's always wonderful when you learn some new things. So. Thank you, Wiki. Thank you so much for inviting me. Anita, thank you so much. And thank you all of you whom I don't see, but uh, it's been a great pleasure and uh, you've been very grace, uh, grace, uh, gracious uh, listening to me. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so I'll count to three. There's a few, Sophia, Bharati. We'd, uh, we'd love to see your uh, pictures, but I'll count to three so not to detain ev everyone. All right, one, two, three. Thank you again and uh, all the best. Can't wait to watch one of your films. Thank you. Thank you very much. All and right. I can't wait to meet you again. <laughs> I look forward to it. My salutations to your husband. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye for okay. now. Bye, everybody. Thank you again. Thank you, Sam. Bye.